All right, why don't we uh, why don't we go ahead and start it? Get go ahead and get started. Uh, I apologize that uh, for the technical snafus that um, have created some confusion, uh, but um, I'm glad that uh, uh, that you were able to find us. And uh, so, um, welcome to the uh, the the computer architecture session in the uh, CSC Research Open House. Uh, I want to. Just do a brief introduction to sort of who the uh, architecture group is, and uh, some things that have uh, sort of gone on recently, and then we'll we'll get very quickly to the to the talks. So um, okay, so this is this is the this is one version of the architecture group, and it's the uh, it's it's the faculty of the architecture group because it would have been way more uh, difficult to capture all the pictures of the students. Um, so these are the faculty. Uh, in rough order of seniority, um, but uh, you know, as is sort of common throughout computer science, it becomes harder and harder to sort of draw a circle around one particular group. But this is kind of our uh, our, our, our best current effort. But a lot of these people are are, are doing a lot of different things. It, it actually, it's a, there's a lot of variety in the architecture group right now. Um, uh, the um, I, I, we we just took a quick catalog of some exciting things that have happened. I think, you know, the last year, a lot of things have slowed down. A lot of things have stopped. But one thing that has not stopped is our students. They're still, still doing great research and, and still being recognized in a lot of significant ways uh, for their research, as well as uh, some faculty. So I just wanted to share a few things that, are, that have happened. In fact, because I want to get to the talks quickly, I'm not even going to read them all because, frankly, there's too many. So I'm just going to sort of walk through and um, just uh, show that there's a lot going on. Uh, a lot of sort of cool things happening, um, a lot of people being recognized for great research, um, and yeah, the list kind of just keeps going on and on. Um, all right, so so a lot of cool things, um, a lot of good research being done, and, and a lot of recognition for it. So we're we're very proud of, of, of particular students and things they've they've, they've accomplished. So we, we're going to introduce you to three of them today, um, and we're going to start with uh, Kazem Taram. Uh, who is um, a fifth year PhD student uh, in my group, uh, looking at sort of all kinds of uh, uh, different architecture level security questions. Uh, he's got multiple award-winning papers. And today he's gonna talk about uh, packet chasing, uh, spying on network packets over a cache side channel. Thanks Dean for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to present packet chasing. An attack on the network that doesn't require access to the network can leak important information about incoming packets only by intelligently observing the effect of the packets on the cache. This work has been published in ISCA 20, and this is a joint work with Ashish Venkat and Dean Talson. While security and performance are not always conflicting goals, as evident by the recent microarchitectural attacks, Performance optimizations are potential security threats. So when we design performance optimizations, we shouldn't treat security as a second class citizen, especially at the system and microarchitecture levels. In the context of network processing, we really need lots of such optimizations such as uh, Intel DDIO to achieve uh, high speed and high bandwidth networking and to reach uh, multi gigabit networks. So as I mentioned, one of these performance optimizations is Intel DDIO. At a high level, in order to improve memory bandwidth and reduce the number of trips to the memory, DDIO sets the destination of the IO traffic to the last level cache instead of uh, the main memory. So now the packets go straight to the last level cache instead of first being stored uh, uh, in the memory. Packet chasing exploits this feature alongside the predictable behavior of the NIC driver to leak information about network packets. To understand the extent of vulnerability, consider an attacker that exploits this to mount a web uh, fingerprinting attack. Imagine the attacker's goal is to find the members of a secret society called uh, ISCA reviewers and the attacker only has limited access to victim system. For example, they can only load JavaScript into the browser. Packet chasing attacker in this scenario detects the successful login of hot CRP, 
without having access to the network packets, uh, sorry, uh, to the network uh, packets only by monitoring the activity on the last level cache. So in accessing the, uh, the web page, a series of uh, packets with different sizes will be sent. And that sequence of packet sizes will constitute a footprint that is relatively unique to that website. What happens behind the scene is that uh, packet chasing intelligently probes the cache locations uh, that have a high chance of being filled by an incoming packet. And based on the evicted blocks, can detect the arrival of packets and more importantly, their sizes. Now, let's back up a little bit and uh, look at the DDIO. And uh, so previously we saw that uh, DDIO sets the destination of the IO traffic to the last level cache. But the question is, how did DDIO field blocks uh, interact with the rest of, last, uh, rest of the last level cache? So it turns out to avoid cache pollution by IO blocks, it limits the allocation of cache blocks by DDIO. That means there is a maximum number of ways uh, that DDIO can allocate in the cache, but there is no partitioning between IO blocks and uh, core blocks. That means an IO block can cause an observable eviction uh, to the core blocks. So we want to be able to detect the incoming packets from their cache footprint. But if we naively probe all the last level cache, we cannot gain any useful information as it takes around 12 million cycles to probe uh, the whole cache. But if we know more about the packets and where they are in memory, we can significantly reduce the amount of probing uh, that is necessary. I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, the details of this, but our careful examination of the uh, driver code uh, gives us some important information that we can exploit here. So uh, one is that incoming packets are stored into a small number of buffers. And two is that uh, these buffers are page aligned and three, is that the driver tends to reuse these buffers throughout the lifetime as the reallocation of these buffers uh, is, is costly. Now that we have this information, uh, we can exploit them to reduce the probe size. Here, we have only monitored 256 cache sets. And these cache sets are the ones that can correspond to first block of any possible page aligned buffer. So in this graph, each vertical line shows the activity on one of these 256 cache sets. And a white dot shows uh, detected activity on the set and a black dot means uh, the, the set is not touched. So, uh, and the y-axis is uh, passage of time. We see an, uh, uh, we see an obvious activity on, uh, on most of the probe uh, cache sets when uh, the network is receiving packets. Now that we can detect arrival of packets, uh, the question is, can we detect the size of incoming packets as well? And it turns out we can, and uh, similar to the first block of the page aligned buffers that, we that, that could be mapped to only 256 sets, and we could deterministically find those sets, the second cache block of a page aligned buffer can only be mapped to another 256 uh, set, and we can deterministically find and monitor those as well. Here in these graphs, uh, we constantly send packets that have sizes of two cache blocks. We see that uh, probing the cache block, bash, uh, cache block corresponding to block zero and block one uh, of all possibly page aligned buffers record a lot of activity but cache two and three see almost none. So that means we can detect the size of incoming packets. And we can confirm that by sending uh, packets with larger sizes and see that activity appears in uh, the block three and block four. So we have already shown that if you, know, if you, if you don't know anything about uh, the memory locations of the buffers, the probe overhead is too high. But if we know a little bit, 
about buffer locations. In this case, that they're always page aligned, we can greatly decrease the amount of probing. But that is still a lot of probing. So the question is, can we recognize the arrival of the next packet with just single probe? It turns out we can, but only if we know the address of uh, the next buffer. So if we don't know the order of the buffers, then we have to probe at least 256 page line sets to just detect uh, incoming packets. And we have to probe many more if we want to detect packet sizes as well. However, if we know the order in which uh, these buffers get filled, then we can actually chase uh, the packets over the cache by only probing the cache set that corresponds to the next expected buffer. And by reducing the probe size to just one, we can detect the individual packet arrival and build a powerful high resolution attack. And we show that using a statistical algorithm, it is possible to recover the order of the buffer in the driver with almost 90% accuracy. So now we want to uh, exploit this to build a covert communication channel. So in our setup, SPY and Trojan are two processes running on two different nodes across the local network. The Trojan wants to send covert messages to the SPY. Normally you can stop the communication between them by using a firewall that blocks, uh, blocks, the, blocks the communication uh, between uh, two nodes of a certain traffic type. But there are uh, many clever network level uh, covert channels that can bypass a firewall if there is a network connection between the Trojan and a sender. Now, what you can do is to revoke the access of a spy process uh, from the network. But even in this scenario, interestingly, packet chasing can build a strong covert channel between parties in the network that even don't have access to the network just by monitoring the activity and the last level cache. In addition to the vulnerability and the attack, we propose a short-term software-based uh, defense called ring buffer randomization and a low overhead hardware-based defense called adaptive partitioning. Uh, so uh, uh, so that, uh, that concludes the talk. Uh, so in, in summary, we propose packet chasing, uh, an attack that uh, on the network that doesn't require access to the network. We build high resolution covert and side channel attacks on the network area traffic. These oh, side channels cool. and covert channels are uh, possible even without the DIO. And we propose uh, adaptive partitioning and ring buffer randomization as two uh, possible mitigation schemes. And thanks for listening to my talk. All right, thanks, Gazem. Uh, that was great. Uh, any any quick questions before we go to the next talk? All right, let's uh, let's go ahead and bring on our next talk. Um, our next speaker is uh, Hung Yu Zhao. He's a uh, fifth year PhD candidate working with Professor Ji Shen Zhao, and he's working on architecture design for machine learning and autonomous driving. Uh, the talk is driving driving scenario perception aware computing system design and autonomous vehicles. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Han Yu, and today I'll present one of my previous work, uh, Driving Scenario Perception Aware Computing System Design for Autonomous Driving. And this work is collaborated with Zhu Bo, Ping Fang, uh, Ira, and Tianchen from Pony AI, and also collaborated with Hui and my advisor, Professor Ji Xin Zhao uh, from UC San Diego. And uh, this paper was accepted by ICCD last year in, uh, accept, uh, as selected as a best paper in chat. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this work is a uh, UCSD and industry collaboration work. Uh, we run industrial level four AV fleets in various locations, uh, road conditions, and also various uh, traffic patterns. We run over three continuous months to collect the data. You know, we uh, run over 200 hours, you know, 2,000 miles of trees is collected. Uh, we cap captured a lot of near accident scenarios. For example, I'm going to show one of them. <clears throat> In this case, our Tom's vehicle is crossing this intersection. And uh, the traffic light is, uh, is a yellow light flashing. 
So we should take the traffic light as a stop sign here, but the white SUV is crossing the intersection from the right side to the left side. You know, it's just ignore the traffic light. Traffic light. Uh, if our Tom's vehicle cannot see this uh, white SUV in real time and perform emergency heartbreak, a collision will definitely happen. So we, we, we claim that Tom's vehicle safety is highly sensitive to the computing system latency. And uh, let me br briefly introduce the state of art level four AV systems. And AV is short for Tom's vehicle here. Uh, basically, there are three main components uh, in the high level uh, AV system. Uh, there are localization, perception, and planning and control. Localization uh, is responsible for localizing the accurate position of the vehicle. And a perception module use multiple sensors like lidars, uh, cameras, readers to scan the surroundings in a de uh, determine if there is any uh, obstacle that, that will introduce hazards, potential safety hazards for the car. And finally, with the, lo uh, with the localization and the perception information, uh, the planning module will plan the trajectory and the control module will send some actuator commands to the car to actually control the car to accelerate or deaccelerate the car. And uh, the uh, high level AV system is run of run built out uh, run on top of the a sophisticated heterogeneous system. It includes high end CPUs, uh, high end C uh, GPUs, and also a set of uh, SSD and uh, other hardwares. Uh, according to our field study, you know, we make a, a significant uh, observation that we observe the perception is one of the most time consuming model compared with localization and planning control. And uh, we also want to show some data in terms of the uh, latency breakdown. We see that the, the LiDAR perception uh, occupies around 65% of the total end-to-end -end latency of the Tom's vehicle. So in this work, we want to optimize the LiDAR, uh, LiDAR perception latency. And uh, before that, I want to introduce how the Tom's vehicle inter interprets a real world. Uh, basically, there is a uh, general technique for the Tom's vehicle to uh, understand the world. It, it's called the occupancy grid. And we can consider that we divide the real world into multiple smaller three D three dimensional grids. And uh, if the if a grid is occupied by an obstacle, for example, for example, in this case, we just know the red grids are occupied by obstacles. So we know, okay, some of the cells will be occupied and you know, the car should not drive in that cells, right? And you know, each grid cell uh, has two variables, so the value and the coordinate. The value refers to that's the probability that an obstacle exists in that grid. You know, we mentioned that the perception is the most time consuming uh, module compared with the localization and the complaint control. So we want to propose some techniques to optimize the perception latency. And you know, the first technique we want to propose is a perception latency model. And you know, with this model, we can understand the correlation between the perception latency and obstacle distributions because the perception, perception module is responsible for uh, monitoring the surroundings, surrounding obstacles. So most of the uh, latency will be spent on processing the obstacles, right? And uh, uh, the obstacle can be uh, represented by two different variables, the uh, obstacle density and obstacle distribution. Uh, we also want to consider the computation resource allocation to, uh, to this model. In, uh, in, in our system, we only have CPU and a GPU, so each algorithm will be only run either on GPU or CPU. And uh, the first step to build this model is to pre, uh, build the obstacle count, count map. And uh, it, this obstacle count map has three levels. In the, for the level one obstacle count map, it uh, just divides the real world into multiple really fine green cells. 
you know, the cell, the grid cell size is the smallest compared with other two levels. And the, with the level two uh, obstacle count map, we just increase the grid cell size a little bit. So uh, in each cell, there will be more obstacles in, in a single cell. And for the level three obstacle count map, uh, we just uh, use the total obstacle count in the, uh, in the visibility, uh, visible region of the car. Uh, just keep in mind that all of these three levels of the obstacle count map are referring to the same scenarios the car is perceiving. Okay. And uh, we, we, with these three uh, obstacle count map, we just get a obstacle density distribution that represents the distribution and the density for the surrounding obstacles. And also, we got a, a, a computation resource allocation vector that refers to which algorithm our module is performed on either GPU or CPU. And we got these two part of the uh, inputs. Uh, and the inputs to the latency model, we just use a simple linear regression method to train this model and get the, the, finally the model input. Uh, when we got this model, if we want to use, the, use this latency model, we just input a specific obstacle distribution vector and this model will tell you how many how, how long the, the perception latency is. And uh, this this latency model builds a connection between the obstacles and uh, the perception latency. And next I will explain how to use this latency model to optimize the system performance. And uh, for each given uh, obstacle distribution, we assign a resource management plan for it. You know, the plan is kind of, the, uh, it, it's not a complex plan. It, it just decides the priority of executing each module. And uh, we just, the, uh, or we, we can just uh, drop some of the distance obstacle checking information if some of the obstacles are far away from the car. And for each class, the class refers to that the specific obstacle distribution, we assign the best resource management plan for that class. You know, that will help the AV system to achieve the lowest latency so that we got a better performance. You know, we also did some modification in terms of the hardware. Uh, so first step, we're gonna to monitor if there is a timeout a timeout refers to that the LiDAR perception latency is longer than 100 milliseconds because uh, LiDAR frequency is 10 hertz. And the second step is to monitor that if there is a continuous timeouts, for example, let's say 100 uh, continuous timeouts. If there's a, tim a continuous timeout, we just perform a resource management plan switching. And for the given obstacle distribution, we just find the uh, appropriate resource management plan for the current scenario. And let's see some evaluation results. Uh, this figure shows that the relationship between the uh, obstacle distribution and the latency. The deeper the color, which refers to that the obstacle in that, in that area will contribute more to the perception latency. You know, we see that the Nearby obstacles may contribute more to the latency and also the density contributes more than distribution of the obstacles. And we also demonstrated this model can achieve a, a really uh, low average error. And uh, with this proposed uh, resource management, we can improve the uh, energy efficiency. We can also improve the uh, performance of the system either uh, uh, for both of the LiDAR perceptions only or the entire system. Uh, let me summarize this, this project. Uh, in, this, in, the, in this work, we've, we observed that the perception latency dominates the level four times vehicle community system latency. And uh, we propose a latency model to uh, predict the latency uh, for a given uh, obstacle distribution. And we also propose a resource management plan that optimize the latency. And uh, finally, our evaluation results demonstrate that our, our um, proposal can achieve high accuracy, low latency, and uh, also better energy con consumptions. And uh, that's pretty much my talk for today. And uh, I uh, uh, thanks for your attention and I'll be glad to take any questions.
if not, let's go ahead and bring on our third speaker. So Dananjay Jagtap is, a, is an MS student in computer engineering uh, who's working with Pat Panudo. Uh, he's interested in building systems that bridge the gap between the digital and the physical world. And, uh, and, and, and again, it's gonna sort of illustrate the, uh, the diversity of, uh, of, of architecture topics um, really throughout this session. Uh, that we work on here at UCSD. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ranajan Jakob, and I am a master's student in ECE, and I work with Professor Pat Panuto. And today I'll be speaking about uh, repurposing cathodic protection systems as reliable in situ ambient batteries for sensor networks. And this is the work um, that was recently accepted at IPSL. Um, so now structures all around us are continuously degrading in a gradual manner. And one of the major reasons why this happens is because of corrosion. Now, corrosion is this ubiquitous physical phenomena that virtually affects all the structures around us and costs up to billions of dollars every year to, um, to, to carry out the infrastructure maintenance for uh, structures affected by it and to prevent it. Now, if this corrosion is not monitored uh, frequently enough, it can lead to dramatic events such as like say, bridges collapsing or pipes bursting. And uh, to prevent this, there are various like protection systems that are employed currently. And monitoring these systems or corrosion is generally difficult because um, they require manual inspection, they are difficult to access, uh, and they're widespread over a large area. Now, this sort of motivates us to possibly automate this monitoring process using sensors. Uh, but what is the challenge that we face over here? The main challenge that we face is deployability. Now, deployability of the system is determined by the ease of the maintenance of the devices and the overall lifetime of the devices. But uh, the deployment of these devices is hard because they are hard to power and they, it's hard to communicate with them or to make them talk to the world. Now, in this talk, we'll be mostly focusing on the power problem. And the reason why we care so much about deployability is because it is fundamental to scaling any IoT solution. Now, how do we power sensors for such a smart infrastructure? We can either plug them in, uh, but it needs infrastructure that's costly, does not scale. We can either provide them with batteries, but that's essentially trading one maintenance problem for the other because of the limited lifetimes. We can scavenge energy from the environment, so the solar thermal RF, but historically it has been proven to be unreliable of sorts. So now taking inspiration for like this aspect of scavenging energy, we try to see if there is an opportunity to find existing reliable battery-like sources in the world that we can tap into and power our sensors. Now, it turns out that potentially our problem could very well be our solution. But before that, let us see what corrosion actually is. Um, so corrosion is the degradation of refined metals. There are various types of corrosion that exist. Uh, one of the most common types is galvanic corrosion, uh, which occurs when there are two dissimilar metals that come in contact with each other through a conducting medium or an electrolyte. Coincidentally enough, this is also the definition for a battery operation. So that means that whenever there is galvanic corrosion that's occurring, uh, tiny battery is being set up locally. And that means that there is driving potential and current available to us. So when you look at this operation on the right, which is the battery operation, uh, it's essentially uh, that battery operation occurs every single time this sort of corrosion happens on our right-hand side. Now, where can we see this galvanic corrosion? Now, galvanic corrosion is quite uh, commonly employed in a controlled manner uh, as the basis for corrosion protection systems, also known as sacrificial and or cathodic protection systems. And these systems are everywhere. These are in our houses, in hot water tanks. These are on ships. These are in bridges. Essentially, each and every infrastructure that we want to protect, these systems are there. But uh, how, do we, uh, how do they actually work? Now, to understand its operation, what we need to understand is that there are two processes that are happening over here. Firstly, is that um, the structure that we want to protect itself is undergoing corrosion. And secondly, is this protection system, which is, this, uh, which is connecting this more reactive metal to the structure that we want to protect, which undergoes corrosion to protect our initial structure from, uh, from corrosion. And uh, this actually happens by, um, by, by when the sacrificial animal provides this sort of protective current or this electron flow uh, to prevent corrosion from occurring. Now, and the protection capability of this entire system is determined by by uh, the potential difference between this anode and the structure. Now, this physical process gives us this very powerful insight into it, is that as long as your anode can like, protect the system, uh, it can power a sensor, which is of the order of decades, uh, essentially. Now, how does it, again, solve the power problem? It's essentially, it sets up, because it's such a spontaneous process, it sets up these local batteries uh, providing this instantaneously available power. 
Um, they are built into the environment, so we do not need a separate infrastructure for it. They're continuously available because of the spontaneous nature of the physical phenomena. And they uh, have a long lifetime because they will last as long as the anode is existing for the order of decades. So now that we see that there is an opportunity uh, to power our sensors, now let us see how we can actually harvest this energy. For that, we first characterize our corrosion battery. And for that, we build this like simple corrosion battery of like a stainless steel bucket filled with water and a magnesium rod. Um, to and we, and we carry out a number of characterization experiments to understand its performance. And what we see is that the peak power that we get from it is about 0.64 millivolts, which is quite low for a battery. And uh, it's, uh, but however, um, this corrosion battery is quite different from what you would see as a AA battery. It's simply because like to give an analogy, uh, it is similar to like a large water tank uh, with a small trickle of water available to us while a AA battery would be like a bottle of water with a larger spirit or a larger flow to it, right? So essentially speaking, our corrosion battery has a low instantaneous power, but a very high energy reserve, um, making it last for a longer lifetime. Um, and also that we see is that the power that we typically need to carry out any sensing event is much higher than the power is available to us. So this is one of the major challenges that we have when designing our system. But for that, we first need to know what our system must actually do. So our system must carry out this sort of periodic once a day measurement of the protection system or the health of the cathodic protection system uh, uh, and send it over. So the thing with that is this sort of like granularity or frequency of measurement is uh, fine with us because corrosion is this very slow and gradual process and not much changes from day to day. But still we want to know reliably enough that nothing exciting has happened even when nothing exciting has happened essentially. And to do so, there are two things we need to do. Firstly, is keep track of our system, uh, wake up once a day, every day, and carry out our sensing. And secondly, is to report this health data back to the user. Now, to carry out this timing aspect of it, we use uh, real-time clocks or RTCs, um, and we see that the power that they consume is, is very low, uh, lower than a corrosion cell, and we can power it. So the main challenge is how do we carry out our actual reporting of health data operation? Now for that, we employ this sort of uh, buffer-based energy harvesting architecture, where we use this sort of supercapacitor as an energy buffer to buffer our trickle power of source that's available to us to power our microcontroller, which uh, carries out the sensing, and the radio, which like transmits the health of the data, uh, health of the system over it. Now, what actually happens in a sense and send event? Uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is measure the voltage uh, from the between the sacrificial anode and the structure to be protected, because this potential difference indicates the protection capability of the overall cathodic protection system. And we send it over using a commercial LoRa wire. Now, does this really work as a system? Essentially, yes. We have built a system from our uh, schematic by implementing commercial off-the-shelf components. And we see that it works uh, very well for our setup. Now, we also see is that when we actually compare uh, results with the ground truth, uh, our system can report the health of our system quite accurately. Now, if you look over here on the y-axis, we see the voltage that is reported by our system between the anode and the sacrificial, uh, between the anode and the structure we detected. And we see that um, the threshold that, is near, that needs to be maintained to prevent uh, corrosion from occurring is very high. But we see that even as this protection capability degrades over time, and even as corrosion seeps into the system, our sensor can still operate and report uh, the current protection capability as long as it uh, does not go below the operating threshold of our sensor. Now, this period in between, or this time window, acts as this early warning system for preemptive maintenance, which was not available to us earlier um, with, when a technician had to physically visit the system and find out what is the status of the protection system. So, if you look at the graph over here at the bottom uh, in blue, that it essentially shows us the current uh, draw that the system takes every, during every sentence and event. Now, the line in yellow shows us the power that's available to us in absence of an energy buffer. And this green line shows the amount of energy we need to actually carry out the sensing event. Now, we see that this sort of, uh, we are only able to carry out these events simply because we use this very uh, energy buffer based architecture to carry out this high capacity operation. Now. Uh, how can we actually deploy them in real life? And simply speaking is that we can just uh, connect it on top of the existing cathodic protection systems. And on the right, if we look over here in this image over here, it's uh, simply a map of the existing uh, corrosion protection system on campus. And this is where like, we simply wish to, like, uh, we want to deploy our system on top of this existing 
uh, test points that are there on campus and actually carry out the health estimation. So what is the key takeaway from it? Simply, we have built this very self-contained infrastructure, uh, self-contained infrastructure monitoring system, which is powered by a system which is much better than batteries, um, such that it lasts the lifetime of the infrastructure, and it's not limited by uh, anything. And uh, other thing is that now we need to change the perspective with which we look at this uh, sort of uh, application, where we see this one city operation is plenty, and where reliability and simplicity is key to uh, ensure deployability and scale. And another thing is that we built this entire thing in my apartment during the COVID pandemic, which is a testament to the fact that how it is simple, rugged, and robust. Um, and thanks so much for your time and attention. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks. Thanks. That was uh, that, that was great. Anybody have any questions for Sanjay? I have a question. I I I'm I'm like you said that it's not limited by anything in its lifetime, and I'm I'm just very dubious that anything that gets deployed is going to last for 50 years or whatever it is. So what, you know, the power is the first, the first problem, right? And so this is very cool, but like, what's next? What's the second problem? So, uh, and that is a very good question. Uh, that is exactly like uh, power is just the first step in solving the sort of lifetime uh, problem that we have. Um, there are various aspects to it. Uh, secondly is the actual, even to an extent, the actual silicon breakdown of the system, like how long can these like devices actually exist without maintenance? And uh, second is also the communication aspect of it, right? Like how long will any of the protocols that we use for carrying out this sort of transmission will exist for or will last for the infrastructure that supports uh, the existing system will last for. So there are various aspects to it, um, to making a system deploy for a very long time. Um, power is just one of them, which we wish to solve so far. All right, well, I wanna thank uh, all of our speakers. That was great. Um, and uh, thank everybody for coming uh, to the uh, architecture session. Um, the uh, poster session is has already started. I've uh, uh, already seen a notice that they're having Zoom link problems there as well, and they do have a solution. So just kind of pay attention. I think there could be one big Zoom session and breakout sessions, which should work fine as long as you find the right link. So. Just, just to worry about that. So please do go and uh, uh, check out the uh, check out the posters. So thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>